So thank you for coming to our uh, presentation today. Um, like I was saying, there's everyone here is connected by uh, for maturity, and today is for maturity day. So we wanted to celebrate by um, by inviting one of our ex one expert in different topics. Um, today we have Dr. Obogu, 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 um from Texas Children's. I practiced that. <laughs> Uh, from Texas Children's, uh, like I said, you know, some of us are here by chance, like me. Uh, I am the Jamila Jackson, and I am the mom of a former preemie that is now tw 20 years old. His name is Zach, and he's the inspiration of everything that I do professionally um, with my PhD in engineering. So I. I you know, I started working with um, Kangaroo Care. I am Colombian, so I heard about it when I was little. And in 2011, I started Kangaroo Care Day to improve uh, the awareness of Kangaroo Care. And um, I hope, you know, you, you celebrate it in, in your communities. Um, so Kangaroo Care Day is the host of this uh, series. And um, we have a hundred, we have registrations of 130 people, 130 people from 14 different countries. So welcome everyone. Um, I would like to introduce Marie. Marie is also um, a wonderful colleague of mine. I met because of the work that we do at uh, the Zaki and Nurture by Design and Kangaroo Care Day. And we got together. She know Dr. Obobi, and she invited um, invited her. So it is, um, you know, I just met Dr. Obobi, which I am so happy. And we are in the same city, and we never met. So we are in Houston, Texas. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen, and um, this presentation is there. This presentation is um, presented by Kinder Care in collaboration with Daphne, which is my, my company, Nurtured by Design, Antonia and Grace, which is Marie's company, NICU alumni, uh, all these other companies are companies that are uh, part of the NICU ne uh, parent network, which I, uh, we are part of, we are members of. These organizations are uh, created by NICU parents specifically to help NICU parents. So we're very, very happy to, um, to host this, this um, event. Now, a couple of things. There is a section on Q&A on, on the bottom of your screens. That's where I would like for you to add all the questions that you have. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end. Um, the way that this is going to go is that we're going to have Dr. Obobi uh, present a little presentation for about 10 to 15 minutes and then uh, grab your coffee and just uh, have a very informal conversation, uh, questions and answers. We have a lot of experts here and, um, and let's, let's get these. Uh, we have lots of parents as well. So um, this is in lay terms. Um, and just just a conversation to um, to present evidence in lay terms. Okay, so Dr. Bobby is a neonatologist, and uh, she's like I said from Texas Children's, and she's going to uh, start presenting. Welcome, Dr. Bobby. Thank you very much, and. Um... Uh, just that's the uh, thank you, Jamil, for this wonderful uh, introduction. And I just have this disclosure on there that this is pr this presentation is not meant to offer medical advice or intended to establish a standard of care. And uh, I am not promoting any service or device. So um, I am passionate about the care for neonates. I am originally from Ghana, West Africa, 
And my journey as a physician has taken me through the United Kingdom where I did some electives back to Ghana and then back to the United States. In the United States, I trained at Cook County Hospital in Chicago for six years for pediatrics and neonatology. I have also worked as a general pediatrician in rural Arkansas before I joined Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital in 2006. So I am going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. So my passion as a neonatologist, where we take care of the sickest and smallest babies, is to see these babies thrive, not just when they leave our NICU, but throughout their lives. So it has been my mission that when they leave us, when we have spent so much care as a team, not just providers, but nursing staff and all ancillary staff to make sure that these babies survive, it is important that they do not succumb to something as devastating as sudden death, sudden unexplained death. So I make it my mission that everyone, every baby who is leaving my NICU has a safe place to stay. So I'll go ahead with a couple of definitions. We all know about SITS, and but the SITS is just part of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is sudden unexpected infant death. SITS is part of sudden unexpected infant death. In the case of SITS, which we mostly know, the death cannot be explained even after thorough investigations, including scene investigations, autopsy, medical tests and examinations. You just cannot find a cause. And as we all know, we probably haven't, ex maybe we have, we know people who might have experienced it. I personally know a couple of people who have experienced it. It is a loss that you cannot come to grips with as a parent. And so it is wonderful that much improvement has been made over the past 30 years. So sudden unexpected infant death includes SIDS, as I have explained before, accidental suffocation and strangulation, and still, Unfortunately, there's a good 34.7% that is still unknown and undetermined. And this information is actually from CDC from 2019 data. This slide shows the improvements that have been made with the reduction of sudden unexplained infant death. You can see that from 1990, the rate of SIDS was pretty high. That's the blue line that you can see. It was about 130 per 100,000 live births. That was a really high uh, number of deaths. The, um, the orange line represents the unknown cause. And you can see that it's held pretty steady. When you look at the green line from 1990 to 20. 19, unfortunately, you can actually see an increase of that. So there is still a lot of work to be done. We can also see that even though SITS decreased in the 1990s, and that was mostly from the back to sleep campaign, this was virtually an epidemic 
I should say, in, in um, many, many, many parts of the world. And so the Back to Sleep campaign in, in 1992 and 1996 did a lot so that by the year 2000, the rate has really decreased, but it's still present. We have still not been able to completely get rid of, of it. And accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed is increasing. So this remains a very relevant topic that needs to be discussed and that needs to be prevented. So why the NICU patient? This talk is uh, prematurity. Today is prematurity day, and we are focused on those babies, our smallest and our sickest babies, who spend time in the neonatal intensive care unit. Preterm infants are two to three times more likely to die from sudden unexplained infant death. And so every effort must be made to decrease that. It is important to transition from therapeutic sleep positions. And when I say therapeutic, I mean, when you go into a NICU, you would know that babies are not on their backs to sleep. They have, um, they have gadgets that are all over them. They have positioners. And that is because you, we need to do that for the physiologic needs of the time. However, they need to transition from these what I would call in layman terms, NICU sleep positions to home sleep positions for safer sleep practices before discharge. So what are some of these positions that we see in the NICU? Kangaroo care is very important. So in the NICU for the youngest and even the sickest, we encourage kangaroo care and it should be encouraged for parent and infant bonding, for temperature control, for physiological stability. For those of us who have been in different parts of the world where we do not have access to expensive incubators, kangaroo care through WHO's effort in promoting it is actually the way that we use for temperature control for the smallest babies because we simply don't have enough incubators. Prone positioning is important when the baby has acute respiratory dis disease. We know that prone positioning improves oxygenation and lung function. And just as a side note, um, people who during these COVID times, when many, many people were on ventilators, prone positioning when they had severe respiratory disease, even as adults, actually helped their respiratory function and their lung functioning. So yes, when you come to the NICU with babies who are having acute respiratory disease, you would see that they are put in a prone position. There are certain babies also who would need to be in prone to be able to be able to breathe. These are babies with upper airway and facial anomalies for, the, for medical people in the group, people with Pierre Robin syndrome, they all with their receded chin needs to be prone um, for them to be able to open their airway. Infants with narcotic withdrawal are sometimes have to be held in positions that are comforting to them while they are withdrawing and they can be found in these positions as well. Preterm infants would use positional devices, uh, Z-flow, um, to just help contain them in the flex position for support and for self-regulation. Uh, so these positions are what we would call the therapeutic positions that you find in the NICU. So what should we do? We know that these are not the positions that babies should be in at home, but we, need, we are sending these babies home. As NICU staff, we need to transition them from NICU to home. The American Academy of Pediatrics actually promotes safe sleep practices after 32 weeks in medically stable infants who do not have respiratory illness. This transition is also important for family-centered care with parents and a provider parent partnership. I believe that the care of the neonatal intensive care unit patient 
requires that the provider and the and the, the provider and the parent are in partnership. We need to develop NICU policies and protocols and procedures around safe sleep, ensure and educate uh, staff and uh, educate and ensure staff and provider buy in and make safe sleep a part of daily rounding. It is not an easy thing to transition from these uh, NICU sleep positions to safe sleep positions. And a lot of effort needs to be in it. So it needs to be part of NICU rounding. Educate parents continuously, answer their questions, and educate parents on infant CPR. So what about parents and caregivers? What should they do before their baby comes home? They should be actively involved in NICU daily care and know their babies well. Breastfeeding is highly encouraged. Smoking by the patient and caregivers, smoking is a major risk factor for, for SIDS and um, parents of premature babies and sick babies should not smoke. Actually, no parents of all babies should not smoke. Ensure that you have a safe place for your baby to sleep in with a crib or bassinet in your room for the baby. Ensure all caregivers for your baby understand safe sleep because you may have to need someone else to babysit for you and they need to understand safe sleep. Be sure to consistently place baby in the crib and on her back if she falls asleep in your arms avoid overheating your baby, and practice tummy time. ABCs of safe sleep. It's a very simple uh, form of educational tool because it's easy and it sticks. And so many NICUs use ABCs for safe sleep. Babies should sleep alone, not with other people. That means not with parents, not with siblings, even for twins, uh, not together, and uh, not with pillows, blankets, and stuffed animals. They should be placed on their backs and not on their stomachs or side. And they should be placed in their own sleeping space, not in an adult bed, sofa, cushions, or any other surface. So beyond ABCs, there's more. We need to use a firm sleep surface. Whatever mattress you're using should not dent and it should not be soft. It should not be on a duvet. Room sharing instead of an infant in a separate room in the first year of life is encouraged. Share the room with your newborn. Keep soft objects and loose bedding away from the baby. Avoid smoking during pregnancy and after birth, including partner smoking, including marijuana use, which has become quite common now. Avoid overdressing, which can cause overheating. Breastfeeding is highly recommended. Consider offering a pacifier at nap time and bedtime. The use of cardiorespiratory monitors as a strategy to reduce the risk of sit is it's not exactly um, encouraged, but it's very, very much uh, out there. There are lots of uh, cardiorespiratory monitors and it's understandable that babies who have been in the NICU and monitors for a long time, parents are anxious and they want to use technology. This is to say, don't feel like if you have those, you are safe from a sudden unexplained infant death. No infant CPR and when to seek medical attention. So now, from all that I have said, um, I know in practice that this requires concerted effort. And so I did a QI study to improve safe sleep practices in my unit. I had a, a as a medical director of a, of a community hospital, I realized that in my neighborhood, in my county, we had the highest, one of the highest um, rates of sudden unexplained infant death in the state of Texas. And so I wanted to do something about it. And I wanted to be sure that every baby leaving my unit would have a place to sleep. 
So I am, uh, my team and I embark on improving safe sleep practices as a QI. And we are happy to, to, I was very happy that we did improve it to be able to transition babies into a safe sleep environment. Now, this slide that you can see would show you pre-intervention and post-intervention. Uh, we did several audits to be able to improve safe sleep practices. And even after babies were discharged, um, we did audits to call them to find out whether they are maintaining these practices because we know that it is not easy. It's actually quite hard uh, to transition from the NICU to home uh, and maintain safe sleep practices. So it requires a lot of reinforcement several weeks before discharge at the pediatrician's office. And for people around you to support safe sleep, encourage it and maintain it. PDSA, uh, uh, just the, the acronym that we use is Plan, Do, Study, Act when you are doing QIs. And so there are several things that we did, several interventions that helped to maintain this culture in our unit, including making an, uh, an educational card by the bedside of each patient and documenting safe sleep education in our medical records as part of discharge teaching and making safe sleep education a part of new hire orientation. So what are some of the practices that we improved um, before we started uh, our safe sleep QI, only 58% of patients were consistently in a supine position that changed to 100% uh, before discharge. Um, head of the bed, many NICU babies, when they are convalescent and ready to go home, have uh, seemed to have reflux and many uh, providers and even nursing staff believe that you need to be on an incline uh, with a, to, to prevent to reflux. But we know that, that that is not true, that the head of the bed can be flat. Um, and a newborn who is convalescent and is well can maintain their airway. And so we changed that practice, improved it to from 51 to 86%. Uh, no cribs in the bed was improved. No positional devices improved, no soft blankets improved. So um, I showed, and our team showed that safe sleep practices can be improved um, in the neonatal intensive care, but it requires work. And so for providers who are with us today, I will challenge you to take this on, on a consistent basis to make it a part of practice. And for patients and families, I would also encourage you to continue and be a champion for safe sleep. Okay, so this concludes uh, this session and we come to the fun part for questions and answers. Thank you so much. As the mom of a baby that came home with basically the hospital, um, I think it's, uh, it's important that we learn how to help these babies survive because we, you know, we have all this work that you, you know, everybody does in the NICU to, to get these babies to survive. So we need to make sure that they survive when they get home. So this is a very important, important uh, topic. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think I'm going to start with one that we received through the email. And it says uh, it's about culturally sensitive safe sleep. And she writes, there is a lot of talk about providing culturally sensitive care and respecting cultural differences. I have seen comments, a bit not from medical uh, professionals, saying things along the lines of my people have co-slept for centuries or tummy sleeping is normal in my culture. What is the best way to address these? The best way is to respect people's views about their cultures whilst educating them to change practice. 
it is true that in um, many aspects of what we propose for safe sleep might be different in different cultures. The evidence, however, shows, and it is very clear across cultures and across peoples, that placing a baby on their backs to sleep is the way to go. Now, when it comes to, there are several factors that, um, that contribute to, is there an echo, a little bit of an echo? Is, is it okay or do you, is there an echo? Sorry. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. So first, we have to respect cultures. We have to understand where they're coming from and to educate. Um, back to sleep, placing a baby supine, that, there's a lot of evidence about that. However, like they said, some cultures say we've been doing this for years. We don't see anything. Sudden unexplained infant death it's common, but it's not that common that you're going to see every babies in your neighborhoods, you know, dying from, from, from it. So you may not see it so much, but it is happening. And when it happens, it's devastating. So respect cultures, but educate. I would also know that depending on where you live, uh, co sleeping might happen simply because in some cultures, they don't have a crib that they can use to separate out uh, where their babies would, would, would sleep. So if you go to many developing countries, even in the hospitals to promote breastfeeding, the, in the, even in the hospitals, the babies might be with their mothers um, to promote that. But there are several factors that cause this. So yes, there are these cultural differences, but a lot of education is still needed and um, to, to promote safe sleep. So Dr. Bobby, if I could um, ask, based on what you've just said, what, you're, what I hear you to say is acknowledge cultural norms, but at the end of the day, we still want to educate those parents on the best methodology, with, which is back to sleep. Is that correct? Yes. And um, as, uh, as, uh, as I've learned about safe sleep, I do know that, for example, in Asian countries, the incidence of sudden unexplained infant death and SIDS is much lower than in some Western countries. And they still may co-sleep. A study was done in, uh, in England, uh, in, in one of the counties in England, they knew that amongst the Asian population, uh, the South Asian population in, in the UK, the incidence of SIDS was lower. However, they, they did co-sleep. It was lower mm -hmm. than the, the non-Asian population, but there were other factors that was probably balancing that out. They were mostly not smokers. The baby was in their room. They were not using soft blankets. So everything comes together. However, the research shows that all these different measures for safe sleep is important to come together. In many cultures, mothers get a lot of help when they have a new baby. They are not trying to run a home. They are not the ones doing everything. In fact, they are told um, that your only job is your baby. When your baby sleeps, you sleep. There are people to take care of the cooking, to take care, help you take care of your other children. In many Western countries, and for example, in the US, mothers don't even have proper maternity leave. They are trying to work, run their homes. They are exhausted. So in our setting, if you put on a completely exhausted mother with a baby in the bed, it's not a good story. However, in some cultures where the mother's only job is with a baby and they don't have access to a crib, they are not smoking, they are not doing any of these other risk factors, it could balance out and you might not see that change. But in the Western world, in the culture in which we are, yes, uh, we need to take all these into, into consideration. 
Having said that, placing a baby on their back to sleep is universal and it is protective. And so that's, that is something that should be promoted. Thank you. There is a question about one of the graphs that you submitted. Um, the question is, what is the score that you describe on the graph? But I'm not quite sh sure which graph it was. I didn't catch the point in which the question came in. Um, but if the questioner would like to unmute and, and um, speak to the question, that might be great. Okay, all right. Um, it came from MB. There isn't a full name. I'm going to try and share my screen to see whether I can get to it. Is she there? It's probably, um, I'm not sure whether this is what uh, the person is uh, referring Hi, can you to. Hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. The previous slide. The previous slide. Yeah, the score median. Okay. 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 So this score was, we made it ourselves. This is not a score that is um, in the textbooks. Uh, we looked at all the different, we picked as a team. So to do this study, first we had to decide, and every unit has to decide. The AAP guidelines says, after 30, after 32 weeks. And most 32 weeks are not physiologically stable to be able to uh, start safe sleep. They still may be having apneas and bradycardias. May still, some of them may still be on respiratory support and all that. But the uh, 32 weeks just says after 32 weeks from AAP recommendations. So every unit, we realize that um, Every unit had to define for themselves within all these constraints, um, what time or what, which babies are ready for safe sleep. And so we came to that, we used 34 weeks in our study and we decided what are the different aspects um, of, of, of safe sleep. And so we considered you to be in safe sleep if all those different aspects in this next slide that is, you are lying supine, your head, the head of bed is flat, there are no objects in your bed, there are no positional devices, no soft blankets. Then you would, you would have a, a score that you are 100% in safe sleep. And that is how we came up to, to the 46%. So with our audits, we would say that during our first audit, 46% of our, of our NICU babies were in safe sleep during the pre-intervention period, as opposed to the uh, higher percentages after our intervention. So those are the, the main, uh, that's how we came up to with this score. One, uh, one, one question that I had, um, is when, when the babies are in the NICU and we start transitioning them to safe sleep at home, um, what happens with the support that we provide for the musculoskeletal system in those last eight weeks before their due date? Um, most babies who are born premature will need occupational therapy and physical therapy to help develop their musculoskeletal systems. The more premature and the sicker they are, the more they need these interventions. And so in the NICU, before the baby is discharged, these have, would have already started and ha they have to continue at home. So babies do have awake moments. And during these times, the various exercises that have been started and the various supports should continue. Kangaroo care can continue at home, um, but in all these cases, when the baby is asleep, 
the baby should be put back in a safe sleep position. Tummy time is very important. Um, what we see is uh, babies are spending too much time on their on on their heads on their on, on the back of their heads because of safe sleep, and they are getting misshapen heads with plagiocephaly, and having to wear helmets, and that's mostly because the babies are on their backs awake or asleep because many people are keeping the babies back to sleep, which is the way to be, but they are always in a swing. They are always in a car seat. There is no rest for the back of the head. The back of the head is always against something. And there's not enough time being given to tummy time, which helps the babies to develop their musculoskeletal systems. So um, we need to, encourage uh, caregivers and, and, and parents to continue the physical therapy uh, exercises that they, they are shown in the hospitals at home whilst the baby is awake. What happens to those NICUs that do not recognize or are not able to have therapists in their NICU because I thought like when we were 20 years ago they were therapists and they really helped us a lot um, but I see that many many NICUs not only in the U.S. but around the world they they don't have a, a, a physical therapist an occupational therapist uh, you know that all the work is you know like the nurse will do or, or assistance to the nurse. Right. Can you talk about a little bit about the, the role of the therapists on this, um, on this um, effort to bring the baby to, to, the, to the house in safe sleep mode? Yes, um, NICU care is a multidisciplinary, uh, requires a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, we in the US and in many developed countries are quite lucky to have so much support for each single baby. And you are right, in many different NICUs, the focus is to survive, uh, is, is, is to live. And so other things like physical therapy take, take a back burner. So it is important that providers and nursing staff who take care of NICU babies learn about, about some aspect of uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy and make uh, and involve the parents early in the care for these uh, babies so they can continue uh, that at home. So there needs to be awareness, even in areas where resources are limited um, to to help these babies that when they survive, which is what we aim for, they would have the best outcomes. So there's need for learning, more learning, more education, and um, so that even within constraints, um, these babies can receive the care that they need. We have one question. Um... From Kathy, she says, "I am a teaching breastfeeding. I am teaching a breastfeeding preparation class. I feel I must talk about breastfeeding at night in a safe environment, acknowledging the challenges and risks of the exhausted new mother. Any suggestions?" Yes, that is <laughs> very hard. Mother. Yeah. <laughs> And indeed, a lot of the strangulations and uh, the accidental suffocations, unfortunately, have happened with breastfeeding, um, exhausted mothers who are breastfeeding. And uh, there's also, unfortunately, more uh, substance use. The use of marijuana um, has gone up. And, and, and that can cause a lot of relaxation. If a mother is using illicit drugs and breastfeeding, that can cause low tone in the babies. And it's, it's not been proven uh, that marijuana causes SIDS or anything like that, but still it's, it has an effect um, on the baby. So as a new mother who is breastfeeding, 
I think that in many in in our culture here, especially in the United States, we want to be perfect. Um, we want our homes to be spick and span. We want to seem that we can do it all. Mm -hmm. But self care is important. My advice is that you can let some things go. It's okay if your house is not spick and span. It's okay if you can't cook all the special meals. Um, it's okay if your makeup is not um, the very best. Uh, take time for self-care. Irrespective of that, you are going to be tired. So you need support. But being aware that you should not be feeding your new baby in your bed and sleeping with the baby in your bed should help you. Just being really not having a, um, I should say, a laid back approach to it and thinking you can leave your baby in your bed when you're tired after breastfeeding, but really being aware that your main aim is to keep your baby safe will help you to know, yeah, I'm feeling sleepy. I've finished breastfeeding. I'm really tired. I need to put baby back in their crib. Um, that's a good Kathy, tip. That's a good. Oh, I was just going to I'm say, sorry. I think that's a good reminder. I was just going to say, I think that's a good reminder, Dr. O, is that it's perfectly acceptable to have you know some sort of seating in your bed whether it's um, reclined or, or propped but when the child is finished although that snuggling it feels wonderful um take him or her or them in the case of my grands um back back to their crib um yeah. or, or their sleeping um area because it's just not worth that that moment of of um comfort Right. I think another issue is uh, kangaroo care, not only breastfeeding, but kangaroo care should at home should always be done with someone there because we yes. know that, you know, we produce oxytocin, we are comfortable, the baby's stable, and, and that conduces to, you know, for the mom to fall asleep. I yeah. fell asleep with Zach in the NICU and it was probably the only good sleep that I had in the, in the five months that he was there. Yeah. So I've been, you know, my mission is to um, allow parents to safely sleep during kangaroo care. But one of yeah. the issues is that somebody has to be watching. So yes. whether yeah. they are in the NICU, obviously in the NICU, all the, the, the staff is watching. Um, but when they go home, you know, they have to have someone um, watching. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's very true. And parents should remember that babies in the NICU are continuously monitored. Their exactly. heart rate, oxygen level, respiration uh, is continuously monitored, very different from home. Though uh, before we send the baby home, we make sure that the baby is stable enough to come home uh, to make the mother or the parents comfortable. And that's why these days we don't use so many apneic, uh, apnea monitors at home because we would observe the baby a good seven to 10 days without yeah. episodes before coming home. We came with an apnea monitor and it was, it was horrible. Yeah. Um, well, and I would submit that regardless of what monitor, um, what, a device, nothing replaces a live person and live eyes right. on, on, on mom and child. Um, and then I think we would be remiss, Jamile, in talking about kangaroo care if we didn't talk about my favorite device of yours, um, which is the, the kangaroo Zach, because it allows um, the parent to have that child close and the peace of mind and knowing that when properly, properly um, worn with the kangaroo Zach, that the child is safe and, and you're able to have your hands free. So yes. I've done my... <laughs> yeah that's... again as, as as an experienced grandmother it is um we i had one grandpa had one we we all love them um that even when we weren't doing we weren't doing skin to skin obviously but um it was just a wonderful way to, for us to know that we were holding the baby properly yeah yes. for, for those that yes. don't know the, the zaki zaki is a product that i that i engineered to hold babies on skin to skin um mm. especially babies that are in the NICU and and that they go home um but uh, Dr. O, one of the questions that I that are, are here is: Do you recommend um, the monitors that are sold in the in, in commercially? Um, I know in the presentation that you that you did, it says do not rely on these um, 
electric devices, electronic devices. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Okay, I will. So generally, in the in the in in the medical field, as um, pediatricians and neonatologists, um, we would not directly recommend most of these devices have not gone through any scientific studies um, to say that they are appropriate for monitoring. And so we don't want parents to rely on them. However, we understand that they are out there and in the world that we live in with um, YouTube reviews and, and reliance on apps for everything parents feel kind of comfortable with that. Now, uh, nothing can replace. So we, what we don't want is for people to have a false reassurance that because their baby is on a device like that, their baby is being monitored as if they were in the hospital. Uh, some of these devices are not as sensitive or overly sensitive in that um, they bring lots of babies to the hospital unnecessarily because alarms are going off. Um, so if you're going to use them, don't think that because you have those on, your baby is completely safe. Nothing replaces your watchful eye. Nothing replaces having the baby in your room. Nothing replaces the safe sleep practices. And you knowing CPR, learn CPR if you have a baby or you're caring for a baby. So there should be you should be careful with um, relying on them. And they themselves would fall, always fall short of saying that this prevents SIDS. They don't want to say that. Um, and yes, you may use them because like I said, we are all dependent on these gadgets. They're very expensive also, but they do not replace that and don't be falsely reassured. Um, I think, Jamil, you have an experience with the apnea monitors, and I remember you saying they were horrible because, you know, they're going to go off all the time and <laughs> for no yeah. good reason. Yeah. I mean, literally, yeah. we just stopped using them Yeah. Um, because it happens. would, you know, if he would move, yes. uh, if he would, I mean, and we don't want to, you know, keep the baby swaddled, and this is something that I did with, with with Zach is teach him to sleep without swaddling. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. swaddling is a like a like a you know um, a straight jacket for an adult. You know, is is yeah. mm -hmm. it, it's you know I just couldn't imagine swaddling. I mean, we swaddle in the hospital, but you know, in the hospital we swaddle because you know we need to keep them quiet, and that's you know that is one one way to keep them quiet right but when they go home you know they sleep 16 hours hopefully yeah. hopefully mm -hmm. they still sleep 16 hours and and we can't keep them in you know without movement all restrained for 16 hours so yeah. um that's another of my my pet projects is to you know to reduce the the incidence you know of that swaddling uh, and allow them to learn to sleep you know, with um, with products like the Zaki, like the Zaki uh, hug, to mm -hmm. give them containment, give them the position and the environment that is conducive to sleep. To sleep and yeah. then, you know, once once the baby's asleep, you remove you remove them, or if the mom leaves, you remove them. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, babies are like 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 adults. You know, mm -hmm. I, I always say, if you're in a, a bed that is not yours, or even if it's yours, and when you want to move, somebody changes your pillow and your blanket, and and you know there's noise, and and you feel un, you know unstable, unsecure, you feel pain. Well, we can't sleep like that. Yeah. Yet we are trying to get these babies to sleep under those conditions. So you know, bringing the mom doing you know kangaroo care is very the mom and the dad, the you know grandparents. Obviously, during COVID, that mm -hmm. has been reduced quite significantly. Um, but you know, if you take care of your baby, moms are happy. Moms happy. that moms that are happy, calm their babies yes. and babies that are calm, have less pain and, and, yes. you know, they, they self-regulate better and they sleep mm -hmm. better. Yeah, so yeah, moms and dads are, are, are very important piece of that big puzzle that is, you know, how do we get the babies to sleep safe?
Um, I Don, can you un unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hi. So I have a question. So um, we have a practice that we do head of the bed elevated until about five to seven days before they're discharged. And I, I had um, got it where every baby was head of the bed flat once they went to an open crib. And I went out on a 10 month medical leave, came back and people had changed my, my policy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just wondering, you know, if we're just five to seven days before discharge, is that enough to show parents of the proper way of sleeping? Or is, are these parents going to be more likely to raise their head of the bed elevated once their baby starts having any type of reflux problems? Yes, that's a very difficult thing in NICUs. Thank you for bringing it up. And so there's a lot of education that is needed and uh, to show that the the medical community the 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 gastroenterologists pediatric gastroenterologists all really do say that you don't need to be head of bed elevated oh, it is I not know. the safe way to sleep the parents are going to do that at home if yep. that is what they see in the hospital yep. uh, whilst the baby is monitored if you have the bed, head of the bed elevated so Don this is something that you will have to champion you would need to get buy in um, need some evidence for your nursing staff and your providers to um, come away I, from this um, practice of elevating the head of the bed yeah, it's a I very made, common practice I had made great strides until I went out and then I came back and I'm like, why are these beds held at the elevated? And they're like, yeah. they took it to be, you know, have you seen the um, safe sleep that Nan put out? Uh -huh. a what is it? Because a lot of people don't know about it. Yeah. yeah. So there's an algorithm in the back of it that talks about, you know, if the baby's not nippling 75%, if the baby has A's and B's, if the baby is an NAS baby. Um, and there was one other thing that that baby needs therapeutic positioning. And all three of my neonatologists believe that that therapeutic positioning is head of the bed elevated. And yeah. I can't convince them otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. And so I've hit a roadblock because they're like, it's right there. We took it out of this NAN safe sleep guidelines and this is the way they're gonna go. And I think I, I won't be able to change it until those three neonatologists retire. <laughs> retire. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a reflux and, you know, suddenly those of us who work in NICUs know that at a certain point, somehow all the babies have reflux. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, and but I was just wondering, is that enough time period, five to seven days, and really to kind of instruct or to show these parents, this is the way the baby should sleep? Or should there be more education? There should like be more bedside education. Cards, like bedside cards, like she was talking about. Bedside cards, you know, this is what we were thinking about a bedside card saying, um, I am in therapeutic sleeping. This is what's going on and I need therapeutic sleep. And then another bedside card saying, I am transitioning to safe sleep. And this is what is happening now with safe sleep. Yes. Yes, yeah. we did that. And I think that's very good because it's a visual. Right. Uh, but the first thing is, is just to actually get your team to really be on the same page with this. Right. Because when people don't, that's exactly what happened with you. The moment you were the champion and the moment you left, they went back to their practices. There's <laughs> this very right. deep belief right. uh, for these uh, practices. And it takes a lot. And unfortunately, your providers who should be actually going by what AAP says have kind of tilted mm -hmm. to whatever Nan put out <laughs> and, and, and yeah. is doing that. But I think if you start off with a, with a bedside uh, plux, then the parents are also away. And right, they usually see that. Yeah, yeah. The, vis the parents will visually see that and that can help. So the parents uh, can say, my baby should be in safe sleep and why is my baby's that's where we really would like to go. The educated right. parent who through parent provider partnership is able to say, what's going on yeah. here? This is the education. Why is my baby not black? Does your, does your facility use um, the halo sleep sacks? Um, like some type of a sleep sack or are you just 
because we were thinking about doing that too is using halo sleep sacks so when they start getting that week before discharge that we're showing them the safe practice instead of using all the blankets and stuff that's yes so we do have that sleep sack in some of our facilities and um, and, and so that, that that that's helpful from all the fluffy blankets and all that right yeah. right and with your Isn't discharge, that like swaddling yeah it's like a it's like a swaddle blanket yeah, yeah it's like a swaddle, swaddle. blanket uh, See, the thing but it does allow the baby to, to move me, when you have when you swaddle you help them fall asleep but you can't remove them because when you remove them, you wake them up, you know? <laughs> right. So Coming from like, that mom. <laughs> like Donna, and you use, I think, I believe you use the Zaki hugs. You know, you put them yes. in the baby. As soon yes. as the baby's asleep, then you remove them. Okay. Because yeah. when he's swaddling, you know, they, they stay swaddled for, for all the time. And the problem is that when, when, when parents see swaddling in the, bed, in the, in the hospital, that's mm -hmm. what they're going to do at right. home. And, you know, so we need to make sure that we tell them, you know, you need to do um, um, tummy time, Yeah. you know, and just, and you can be the bottom of them and just have do tummy time when, you, when they're on your chest, but, you know, I mean, they have to do tummy time. Um, there are babies with flat heads. There are babies that, that you know, they have weak um, movements because yeah. they, mm -hmm. you know, they don't move. Right. Um, I think we have one more. This is what we're going to do. I think, uh, I don't know if you can stay a little bit longer, Dr. O, and answer yes, a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, at, you know, we, before, we want to before we, stop at 11. We, okay. Oh, I was just going to clear. I'm sorry. No, go <laughs> ahead. <we're> both, <laughs> the commercial person I need is making uh, that we have to clarify. Uh, I have no affiliation with Halo oh. Sleep Sacks, but to clarify that Halo Sleep Sacks. There is a sense of swaddling around the midsection, but the infant's arms are free. So I just don't want there to be that we've misled people on how oh, the halo yeah. sleep sack is, is comprised. And that's why units transition to it is because the baby has the, the sense of swaddling around their midsection, but then you don't have the confinement of their arms. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but just the way the conversation was going, it sounded as if we were describing something that was essentially swaddling the arms and that's not how it's made. Yeah, there are so many devices now. In, in, there are in, so many. Yeah, so many. it's hard to keep up with them, but. <laughs> so with that note, I would like to thank Dr. O. We are going to officially close the, the, uh, the presentation, but we will stay a little bit longer to, uh, to answer more questions. Um, okay, so one of them is from Joke. I think if you can please uh, unmute yourself. Welcome from the Netherlands. Yay. We can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Oh no, let me read the question. Um, we in the hospitals should give the good examples. So no swaddling, not monitoring before going home so that parents trust their infants, etc. cetera. Um, and then uh, what is the evidence on head elevated beds? Do you know? Well, um, elevating the head of the bed is, more of a practice um, and I know that it's a long long it's a practice that's been there for a very long time um, that is why it's so hard to break so truly the current evidence does not support elevating the head of the bed in babies who are clinically stable. But I also do know that sometimes you would have a baby who truly seems to be having um, reflux. And what you do with those babies is to actually, and these are usually convalescent babies, to actually keep them upright after a feed for, for quite a bit of time between 15 to um, to 30 minutes, we know that that's very hard to do in the NICU when the nurse has three or four convalescent patient babies to take care of. Uh, but 
keeping them more upright after a feed is better than just the incline. But we know that the incline has it's, it's, it's been there for so long, but there's not much evidence to support it. So we still believe that reflux babies can still be put flat. But I understand why people keep them on an incline because it's a long, long, long practice. And, and well, it's, it's also what is recommended for adults, right? To keep the head higher than the heart. Isn't that the, the mm -hmm. recommendation when you have heartburn and reflux? Yes, it's, it's, it's the recommendation for, for adults, but we can wake ourselves up. But um, for babies mm -hmm. where you could potentially die if you are not in a safe sleep position, um, we would have to have other means, which is keep the baby upright as much as you can. But when you are laying them down to sleep, put them, uh, put, put them flat. Now, there are some babies in extreme cases where they truly have reflux disease. And there's a difference between having reflux and spitting up and having reflux disease, uh, where there is significant esophagitis and um, you just can't get anything down and everything else has been ruled out. Um, but very few babies in the NICU actually have reflux disease. So in the extreme cases, that, you know, the doctors, uh, including your, the gastroenterologists could, but most babies in the NICU are going to have reflux. All babies have reflux. That's why they always spit up. They all babies have reflux by way of their physiology, uh, but we have to differentiate between reflux disease and just uh, reflux. Um, I, that's new to me. <laughs> Cause Zachary came with really, really bad reflux. And yeah. um, we thought that he was helping to put him you know, and we always kept his head a little bit higher. So yeah. again, that was 20 years ago. So there is a lot of evidence to prove things that we did wrong. Yeah. Um, I would like to see if Jake can unmute and talk about, um, you know, acknowledging and trying to help, you know, um, I think it's very important to talk about acknowledging that the parents are, are exhausted, you know? Yeah. Oh, Jackie. Yeah. Um, Jackie, sorry. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Yamale. Um, <clears throat> excuse, I have my grandbabies with me, so you might hear a few squeals. Um, oh, in the NICU, such stress oh, is such a... Oh, 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 yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> very, very stressful environment, um, especially in the very small, uh, when they start in the very small um, birth weight um uh, situation and they've been in the NICU for months before they even get to go home um and they probably have uh, <clears throat> if we were going to measure everybody some form of PTSD from their exposure to all of that mm -hmm. on top of that uh, a constantly rotating staff so they see many many different people with variation on a theme and i think consistency is part of the problem like what was, what was addressed in the presentation um so uh that that messaging is really important but acknowledging to the parents that 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 they need to have really good self-care methods and support around them well before they go home mm -hmm. um and thank you so much for showing your uh, improvement processes. No matter how much we try, um, we still have deficits in uh, the work uh, of improvement. And we have a constantly renewed younger staff coming in and staff shortages that I'm sure everybody is dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to mitigate those processes for the better outcome of the babies and um, more messaging coming from people like you will be very helpful. And uh, with that, I'll say goodbye, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So there is a comment that I think is very, very important um, to, you know, to, to bring up. And it's, uh, it's uh, from Joke. I think, I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, 
Are you? Oh, you're unmuted. Can you? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can yes, hear you. I, I, Hello. I changed, I changed the microphone. Oh, good. So my, Welcome. My, my, uh, thank you, thank you. My remark is that all care should be individualized, not be general. So all infants in a head elevated position, all infants on the monitor, all infants swaddled, that is, that's not good care. Care should be individualized. How do you pronounce your name? Joke. Joke. Okay. Otherwise, it sounds like I am a joke, but I'm not a joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. I knew I was okay. mispronouncing you. That's why I wanted no, you to no come problem. up. No problem. <laughs> but yes, individualized uh, is is very important. I am. Uh, we we are members of the NeedCap family. Um, uh, family members of NeedCap, and we are. We definitely. Um, appreciate when our babies looked at as a person not as a number so exactly. every baby should be that's why we have wonderful clinicians uh, in every NICU uh, and we want to empower the parents and actually there is I'm not sure if she's still on uh, Andrea Hickens yeah Hickson let me see if I can allow her to come in Hi. Um, she has a, a she she started a, fun, a foundation as a non for profit. She's one of the uh, parents that started a com uh, an organization to help parents, and and all she does is help parents go in the transition to the NICU. Um, hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hey. So can you um, can you talk a little bit about the the like your organization and how you're helping parents and where where can parents find you um, absolutely I think it's a very good resource for for the clinicians and the parents to know that you know you are helping parents once they go home yes thank you and i love this um webinar today and this q a i think that you know you have such a um such a host of support when you're a family in the nicu you have, you know, doctors, nurses, specialists, um, lots of not-for-profit organizations, you know, and all of this support. And then it is so, so overwhelming to be able to, you know, finally reach this day that you can't wait for, but also, you know, you're like, when does my baby get to come home? When does my baby get to come home? And then that day comes and now this whole support system that you had, you know, kind of leaves as you go home. Um, it's scary and especially sleep. Uh, I didn't, uh, my husband and I were talking about this webinar and just like how the first night that Lucy, our first preemie was home, we just listened to her breathing the whole night. We did not sleep. <laughs> so it was like, is she breathing? She's breathing. Is she breathing? She's breathing. <laughs> um, you know, um, but the organization that I am launching, it's called NICU Alumni and the goal of that organization is what we want to do is just to help families navigate life after the NICU. And, um, and so for now, right now you can find me on Instagram and we're in Miami, uh, Florida, but my, both of my daughters were born in New York. So I still have a lot of ties to New York and the hospitals there um, and the family advisory committees there. So, you know, as we grow, what we hope to do is help families that um, you know, you're home now, uh, what, what can you look to do to support your child? A lot of the first steps is like the evaluations for early intervention and it's different depending on where you are, but it's not easy. So just kind of helping families get on that road and on that path to get a new community of support. I wanted to like ring a bell and, and, and shout in complete affirmation when you were saying Dr. O that people are exhausted, moms are exhausted, families are exhausted. We weren't meant to do this alone. There are so many cultures that you were saying that didn't experience the SIDS as high and prevalent because they had more people involved in community helping to raise the infant. And so that's what we wanna be as NICU alumni, helping these families um, as they raise their infants and young toddlers and as they develop. And what do you need to kind of have in mind 
because the NICU journey is very unique to each family. And then, you know, so as you leave there, you're going to have unique things that you're focusing on that might be different from typical families and typical birth experiences, you know. And I, I think uh, that's really important. I think another point that I would add is when you look for a pediatrician to make sure uh -huh. that that pediatrician is very, you know, is, is in tune with having NICU babies, because there are pediatricians Absolutely. that, that if your first is, your, you know, the first patient that they have is your NICU baby, you know, there is a big learning, learning curve. So always look to see for a pediatrician that is a developmental pediatrician, a pediatrician that has had NICU babies and, um, you know, as patients. Uh, so they understand all the, the things that you have to go through. Like, you know, we had to wait in the car until Zachary, you know, Zachary was going to be called. So we didn't have to wait with a lot of babies in the waiting, waiting area. So um, things that, you know, usually parents don't think about, but that's, that's what we have to do to keep the baby safe once they, get, they go home. Um, do or even just understanding. Other... Oh, I was just going to say, or even just understanding the growth process for a, a, a preemie um, mm -hmm. baby at discharge, that you're not necessarily going to use the same growth chart that you would use for a, for a term baby. And then I would encourage parents that, that are not aware, ask if, and, and understand whether you're, um, hospital has clinics, make use of those resources because um, they will really help you customize. I love um, Joe Kay's, um comment about treating each patient with a level of customization as opposed to standardizing care, so. Yes, a follow-up clinic. Unfortunately, not every NICU has a follow-up clinic. Right, right. But I think uh, parents also, you know, need to, um, you know, lobby for having therapists in the NICU, all these resources that, you know, everything that we do in the NICU has, you know, everything has some kind of result in the rest of the lives of the babies and the families. So, you know, investing in this care at the beginning in the NICU and in the, um, you know, when they're little, then we're going to have better outcomes for these babies. Um, do we have any other question? Any comment? Let me see if there is anything. Um, there's Jamile one or two. I'm not sure what that means. Is she here still? Okay. Well, Marie and I want to thank everyone, especially Dr. O for being here celebrating kangaroo, I mean, uh, sorry, um, prematurity day with us. Uh, we will have another one in kangaroo care day, but this one is to celebrate King, uh, prematurity day. And um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you have our email. Uh, tell us how you like it, what topics you would like to see. And uh, and Dr. O, you are, you know, uh, you, you live very close to me. One day I want to <laughs> meet you in person. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for volunteering to do this, um, this um, session of experts. Marie, do you have anything else to, to, to add? I would just echo your gratitude to Dr. Obovi. Thank you so much. Um, and then thank you, Jamila, for the, being the brainchild between, behind this wonderful forum of learning. And we're excited um, for you guys to see the other um, experts that we bring to you. We've, we're building a bench, as they say. So stay tuned. And, and I know Dr. If, Bobby, thank you so much. Yeah. And I know we have um, participants that are experts. So if you're willing to you know, yeah. talk about the evidence uh, in lay terms, please let us let us know and we would love to have have you as a guest. All right, thank you so much. We did thank you very great. much. I love this session. <laughs> this is one of you know, I love doing this. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. O. Thank and you. Everyone thank else. You. Anytime. Bye bye. Bye.